this first of our uh, conversation series, uh, I will be uh, talking to uh, Alan Doss, uh, and I'll be talking about his book, uh, Peacekeeping in Africa, Learning from UN Intervention in Other People's Wars. Uh, Alan Doss is a very experienced peacekeeper, and for the past or the last 10 years of his uh, career as a UN official, he served in senior leadership positions at the very front lines of United Nations uh, peacekeeping. First in Sierra Leone as deputy special representative of the Secretary General, then he moved on to Cote d'Ivoire also as a deputy SRSG before he took charge of the 15,000 strong operation in Liberia and eventually moving on to the most difficult and challenging mission of all, the UN operation in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where he was in charge and head of mission from 2007 to 2010. And in the course of this conversation, we'll be touching on a number of issues that we'll be getting back to throughout the course and to which uh, we will no doubt uh, refer later. So please sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Alan, the, the subject of your, of your book, uh, A Peacekeeper in Africa, covers, of course, uh, 10 years uh, you worked in the field of peacekeeping. But I, I wanted to start with the, your UN career as a whole and the fact that you moved from the development side of uh, the United Nations activities into peacekeeping at a particularly interesting time in 99 and 2000. And I wonder whether you could reflect or tell us a little bit about the reasons and why you moved into peacekeeping or why Kofi Annan asked you to move into peacekeeping and whether having been in the development field um, gave you an added perspective on, on the challenges in, in the field. What, what were the triggers? Why did you move, as it were, from that uh, side of the UN system into the uh, peace and security, and particularly peacekeeping? Well, I can't say it was all deliberately planned and worked out like much of my life and professional career. Um, it was, um, it was, it was, it happened. An opportunity came up and, and I thought this would be really interesting. I mean, prior to that, as you said, uh, Matt, I'd worked pretty much on the development side with uh, the UN Development Program, UNDP in a variety of countries in Africa and Asia, um, plus policy assignments in New York and Geneva. Uh, and, uh, and, and also some humanitarian work, uh, notably when I was in Thailand, uh, working on the um, Cambodian refugee issues. Um, but then, you know, at the end, throughout the, the 90s, increasingly, partly because of, as you know, the, the space created by the end of the Cold War, the UN became much more engaged in, in a broader range of issues which went beyond the traditional development uh, which was essentially technical economic and increasingly got into the whole issues of governance uh, and uh, good governance and, and how to uh, deal with crisis. And of course, it, 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 it coincided, not, well, it wasn't coincidence, but it coincided with the, with the eruption of a variety of conflicts post Cold War in Africa in particular. And increasingly we saw that uh, there wasn't this strict demarcation between what was development what was humanitarian and what was uh, issues of peace and security. Um, and it, but this in turn with the feeling of all these, these big missions, it created all kinds of tensions within the UN and the UN system uh, in terms of who does what, uh, who has primacy of position and so forth. And at the time I was in New York, I was then heading up um, as part of the reform effort that, that Kofi Annan had started just after he became Secretary General the aim of which, one of the principal aims of which, was to get the UN to work better together uh, and not to have these silos, which had grown increasingly um, um, problematic as we moved into these areas of governance and rights and moved out of the purely technocratic approaches to development. And it came to a head in a way in Sierra Leone in 1999 um, and then into 2000 where the UN had had fielded a, a multi-dimensional mission, um, which included not just peacekeepers, but administrators, development people, human rights especially. And that mission went badly astray. 
partly because the peace agreement was broken, there was hostage taking, and the mission really tottered on the brink of collapse. Um, and there were concerns that this was again a rerun of what had happened in Srebrenica, what had happened in Rwanda, what had happened in Somalia. The SG went himself, Kofi went himself, went to see the situation. Um, the mission was able to hold its ground. It got a lot of support from the UK, which fielded a, a mechanized brigade. David Richards, Lord David Richards now, was the commander as a, as a young brigadier. And uh, the situation was stabilized. But out of that, and his visit in particular to uh, Monrovia, um, it seemed to once again, um, it, not seem to, it did raise this issue of how come the UN is so fragmented? Uh, and the UN in Sierra Leone was one part of the UN was against the other part. There were all kinds of claims of, um, of, of uh, uh, incompetence and um, lack of communication. And, and part of that was true. So he was determined that he, as part of his reform program, he wanted to pull it all together, stop having these multiple UNs all quarreling with each other, which cast a lot of um, uh, doubt about the effectiveness of the UN and certainly was not well seen by the Security Council members or indeed by, by major donors to the development side. So he created this post, I was asked to take it on, which was an effort to bring together um, the development, humanitarian and peacekeeping political side, not in, a, not in a sense of one would give orders to the other, but there'd be more cohesion, there'd be more coherence between what we were trying to do. And frankly, less of the effort to pull the blanket to one particular side of the bed. So that's how it happened. I have, as I said, I was in New York, I was handling some of these issues at the headquarters level, and somebody I knew very well, um, who was the then Assistant Secretary General in the Peacekeeping Department, Hedy Annaby, who I'd got to know during my days involved in the Cambodia crisis, the decade before when he was also involved in putting together the mission that actually helped end the, the, the war in Cambodia. He asked me whether I'd be interested in going. And as I said in the book, after asking uh, the one person who counted in all of that, my wife, uh, had, I agreed to go and try it out. It was the first time that had started. The then head of UNDP was very keen on this, uh, uh, Mark Malik Brown, now Lord Malik Brown. Um, he pushed this, um, he got it through. You know, there are a lot of you know, concerns, particularly about the humanitarian side of the UN. UNICEF, WFP, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and so forth. But Mark, I must say, was the one who, who really made sure, because these things wouldn't have worked and didn't work. And I've made that point in the book without, however well you get on with your colleagues in the field, yeah. if you don't have that headquarters backing, if you don't have some sense of direction and coherence from the top, it won't work. Yeah. And I have that both from the Secretary General and his staff, and particularly from, as I say, Mark Malik Brown, who kind of, uh, held the fort uh, at headquarters. Yeah. Well, I, want, I, I, I want to come back to, um, to Sierra Leone in, in a minute, because um, there are so many interesting observations you make about your experiences there in the book. But I just want to, to, to stay for one more second on your experience uh, in the field of development beforehand, mm -hmm. and ask whether in particular your experience of conflict on the African continent was something you could usefully bring with you. I'm thinking particularly here of your on the paper, fascinating three-year stint as a UN resident coordinator in Zaire. Yeah, yeah. Because the this, this sense of continuity, particularly in the DRC, yeah. about the way the political system was working is quite powerful. Yeah. So one would have thought if you were, if you yeah. were hanging around, as it were, with Mobuto uh, in the 80s, uh, you would have a rough sense of how the system, uh, political system to some extent worked, the sort of infamous mm. uh, uh, system D. Um, yeah, the, the difference was that it, up until basically the, as I say, the early 90s and the, the new wave of not just the peacekeeping, but a sense that the UN was more free to work on issues uh, concerning uh, politics, governance and so forth. Up to that point, and particularly in, in, I remember in Zaire, we were very much constrained. We were very much involved in, in trying to improve the economic system, working with the World Bank and the IMF. But we weren't really challenging the fundamentals of, of, of uh, national governance. But we could see that without that, without changes in society, without above all reigning in the, the, uh, the, the kleptocratic, if you will, governance of the Mobutu regime, um, 
we weren't going to get very far because all the progress we could make in the economic area was being lost through poor governance, massive corruption, waste. Um, and we were rather constrained with that. And I, I, again, in the book, I mentioned this, that when um, uh, Perez de Cuellar came on a state vi official visit to the, the, the Zaire at the time, uh, we met with Mobutu and his ministers. And certainly with Mobutu, there was no talk about really reform and all those sorts of things. Um, even though Congo was already on its descent, the economy was, begin was really beginning to fall apart. And that accelerated and eventually precipitated uh, uh, his departure, his, his, uh, his um, in effect, his, his loss of, uh, yes. of power. But at the time, uh, we, we didn't get into those sorts of things. In fact, the evidence of the folly was all around us yes. uh, when we went to his palace in Banalite and so forth. But we were much more concerned, and understandably, in a way, the Secretary General, with how and the role that Zaire, as it was, um, and Mobutu was still a towering figure in Africa, yes. could help with issues like South Sudan, with issues about ending of apartheid in, in South Africa, the war in uh, Namibia and in Angola, you know, in which Mobutu was implicated. Um, yeah. Via is, you know, we, we, we know... Uh, he was used by one and the other and he used them so we didn't really get into that so increasingly we saw this and this was being discussed uh, but it was very much within a certain framework yes. and we, our approach was more techni technical technocratic yeah. how can we improve i remember we did have a discussion how to improve the civil service yes but we never asked the question how did the civil service get into this situation in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. how do we improve the state state industry without raising issues about how all those state industries had been ruined by exploitation, corruption, uh, and so forth. So we kind of, and this is why, of course, much of that work was of, eventually was not entirely successful yes. or successful, full stop, because we were dealing with the symptoms and not with the causes. Yeah. And that's where we changed, shifted, I think, yeah. more and more, particularly in the peacekeeping operations, yeah. where we had to deal with these fundamental political, the fundamentally uh, political dysfunction of yes. the state. Yeah, uh, which, which brings me to, to Sierra Leone, um, where of course you deployed as the deputy of Sierra Street with special responsibility for issues of governance and, yeah. st and stabilization. And uh, it's interesting you mentioned earlier about this that you know the British were there and they helped bring you know a, an end to a particular phase of the conflict. But as 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 one Brit has has admitted, uh, the role of the British, of course, in bringing the war to end is one that improves with telling, yeah. especially as other operations haven't gone that well. And what I think you make very clear in the book, and I can quote it here, I think it is important. And I read from your book that the war in Sierra Leone was not ended by a single diplomatic masterstroke or military intervention, but rather by an accumulation of decisions, events and incidents, some of which were fortuitous. And I yeah. think that's a very interesting reflection on, on the way in which many of these uh, uh, civil wars end and how you proceed in stabilization. But I wonder if you are sort of, if you have to put your finger on it, and you do to some extent in the book, what are the sort of critical elements in the case of Sierra Leone yeah. that, that, that made it possible to build some kind of stability and that you was able to exploit and that you were able to exploit? Mm -hmm. Well, it's always a combination of things. Um, it was very clear, I think, that um, the basically the, the capture and imprisonment of Fode Sanko was very important to mention. Because Sanko, although um, in many ways a, um, you know, a, a pretty dreadful character, um, he was nevertheless, as is often the case, able to mobilize and retain the loyalty of several thousand fighters. Um, and as long as he remained on the scene, um, it would have been very difficult for the government to fully get control. Just like in Liberia with, with, um, with Charles Taylor. Um, it's very interesting, the study of these characters, because in the, in the gradual progressive deconstruction of the state that happened in numerous African countries, and but particularly in Syria and Liberia, in these circumstances, these charismatic, charismatic, rather um, 
uh, ruthless figures emerge. Yes. And the outside world doesn't really know how to deal with them always, you know. Um, and so their removal from the scene w was really important. Uh, but it was a combination of things, how they were removed. Um, I think while the British involvement after the disaster of the summer of 2000, and 2000 was to provide an immediate stiffener. Yes. But they never moved outside of the, the Lungi Peninsula, which is essentially, but that, that was good. It sort of gave the UN breathing room to regroup, to make some changes, frankly, um, change force field commanders, um, force commander, um, reinforce and per a little bit the, um, not a little bit, uh, the staff and so forth. So that's what it was, but it, it, it and that was critical at that moment. Um, and then the implication that the UK made it clear that they would remain as an over the horizon force if need be. But it wasn't the Brits who went into the Diamond District. It was first, a, believe it or not, a Bangladeshi unit. And then was followed up by a, a good tough um, um, uh, Pakistani brigade uh, that, that moved in there um, and, and really did a good job. So. I mean, you have these these moments, pivotal moments, where um, and it was touch and go. There was talk about withdrawing the mission. I know that because Bernard Mie, who was the Under Secretary General, and I quote him in the book. Actually, I refer to him. Uh, told me personally, and I recount this that in New York there was there was really serious discussion about whether they should pull out. Bernard says that he was one of those who, after a visit to Sierra Leone in the middle of the crisis, went back and argued with. Um, with um, uh, with the sector, well, Tom Kofi, that he should not, they should not, they should stand firm. The other dimension of this, which is also very important from the British perspective, was Jeremy Greenstock. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy in New York was a very, very effective permanent representative, as you know, very yeah. articulate, very committed, and he also rallied the council to stay the course. There wasn't a cut and run, and that almost happened, I think. Uh, so between them, uh, and with Kofi's decision to stay the course, uh, they were able to um, to pull this together, stop it, and make sure the RUF knew that they couldn't simply once again overrun Freetown, as they'd done twice before with disastrous consequences for the population. So I think you bring all these elements together, um, and, and as I list them in the book, I mean, uh, Tijan Kamba, unlike, let's say, uh, Taylor in Liberia, was a very sympathetic ca character. Yeah. He spoke the language that um, uh, people wanted to hear. Frankly, he was educated, including in Aberystwyth. Um, yeah. He did a law degree. He, he, so, I mean, and that is very important, you know, to um, that, that sort of sense of, um, not that he's one of us, but that he spoke the language that, yes. that was understood. So he created a sympathy. The other element was, frankly, also Tony Blair. Yeah. And you know the Blair connection with Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. His father had lectured at uh, Fura Bay. Um, and he wanted to, an interesting case of hubris, I think, because yeah. I think he learned the lessons of quick and important intervention in uh, Sierra Leone, and it worked. Yes. Did this set him up for later failure? I don't know. His yeah. biographers will decide that, I suppose. But nevertheless, it was the right thing to do at the right time. And it was a bold move. And I often wonder, as I've said in the book, if the Tories had won that election and not Tony Blair, I just wonder if there would have been the same level of commitment. Yeah. I'm not sure. I really am not sure. Um, plus the backing, again, uh, I have to say, uh, I recount some, uh, some anecdotes there in the book. Again, Claire Short and, and Robin Cook. So you have these elements that came together, fortuitous, serendipity, if you will, but that's how things end sometimes. And a number of the conflicts where I've been involved, that element, you know, you can plan as much as you like, but there are elements there, the personal elements, fortuitous elements, yeah. that uh, the things happen. And of course, what you have to be ready though, is to take, uh, take the opportunities that these, um, these uh, that arise to, to yeah make headway so i can't claim that it was all yeah. planned beautifully out and um yeah. no it, it yeah. happened 
we chose opportunities and came back from really it was a disaster in 2002. Yeah. It really got, nobody thought in 2002 that within two years or so we would have um, you know got to a peace deal disarmed largely the IUF um, and began uh, you know a restoration of state authority process. Yeah. Uh, I think um what you've said and, and what you write about, um, and indeed all, all four of those major missions you, you were part of, uh, of course, raises the issue of seizing opportunities as they arise and also dealing with a variety of different characters. And I wonder whether one sort of thematic issue which you cover throughout the book, which, which is raised by this, of course, is the whole issue of what approach you take to uh, transitional justice and how to deal with people that have a distinctly uh, dodgy uh, war record. I mean, as I think I mentioned in my review of your book, I think Liberia is very, very interesting because the, the national transitional government of Liberia, paradoxically, was an absolute disaster uh, those two years in terms of the economic reconstruction of the country, because they were all essentially, it was a kind of warlord's feast. Uh, but that mm. bought critical sort of time because you had put in the clause that they had to leave after those two years. And I yeah. wonder whether, what, is it possible, how prescriptive can one be about the approach to transitional justice in these kinds of settings? I mean, the Lomé Peace Accord is interesting in the sense that you could argue you were, you were set up for, for disaster sooner or later by entering into that kind of agreement with very dodgy characters, mm -hmm. but other people you have to deal with. And as you said, some of these, you might not, they might not be likable characters, but they might hold the reins of power and they might be charismatic and you might need to bring them on board. What sort of dilemmas did that present for you as a, as a head of mission? Yeah, well, in all the missions, it presented these difficulties, um, frankly, and some it, it eventually worked out, others um, um, not, not so well. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you have to deal with the deck of, you with, the, with, the, with the cards that are dealt you. And, um, for example, in, in Sierra Leone, I, I have no written proof of this, but I know that some assurances were given to the IUF leadership that they would get amnesty. They had seen what had happened at Lome, where even though the Secretary General had instructed his representative to the talks, I think it was uh, Okello at the time, uh, to enter a reserve about not granting amnesty, that had always been the practice. Um, and some would argue it should still be there. Um, and I do think that the RUF, in fact, I know, were promised certain advantages, scholarships abroad, that sort of stuff, if they, um, if they sort of basically went along with things. Uh, that, of course, would have appalled uh, those who would argue that, um, you know, justice, uh, had to be done and that people have been involved in truly horrendous, horrendous uh, activities um, needed to be um, brought, to, brought to justice. The problem arises is when you then find yourself dependent on some of these people to yes. make things work. Yes. And that was Liberia par excellence. Um, you know, Charles Taylor was not tried and found guilty for what he did in Liberia. Well, he did some pretty awful things there. It's what he did in, or was said to have, or proven, I should say, because it was the court that decided to have been involved in atrocities in Liberia. The same, although he was subsequently acquitted, Bemba in the Congo. It wasn't what he did in the Congo, but what he was first alleged to have done in the Central African Republic. So there were other people in Liberia who, um, frankly, certainly uh, could have been put on trial um, if there had been a similar tribunal as there was for Sierra Leone. A decision was made <coughs> excuse me, not to go down that route, <coughs> talking too much, <laughs> not to go down that route. And it was ECOWAS, I think, was keen, because <coughs> ECOWAS <coughs> was largely in the driver's seat for the um, Accra Accord. I think they had decided that they wouldn't go down that road. And so people who probably should have gone to a court didn't go to a court. Yeah. Um, we had a bit of both in, in both Cote d'Ivoire and then in, and in the Congo. But in all cases, 
<clears throat> it was largely, let's be honest, it was the losers who went to the court. Yes. yes. And this is, a, this is troubling. And today in Cote d'Ivoire, it is still, <clears throat> gosh, I'm sorry. That's right. <clears throat> There's still consequences of that because after the uh, President Ouattara and the support of the FN won power, based on an election that was certified by the UN, nobody from the, um, <clears throat> the government side was, was um, indicted and sent off to The Hague. And that has left a lingering uh, problem, which is again coming to the fore and has come to the fore in Cote d'Ivoire. So, the problem is that if you go for selective transitional justice, this is the problem. Um, and does transitional justice have to be about courts? Are there alternatives? Colombia, as you may know, outside of my immediate DC experience, but I was involved uh, there with Kofi uh, in the run-up to the agreement that ended the war, so disons, in, in uh, Colombia, and met with the, um, the, uh, the FARC in Cuba with Kofi, to explain that transitional justice couldn't be avoided. It wasn't a popular message, but Kofi gave it to them. Um, but um, what they did do was come up with a formula which certain elements in Colombia denounced, but which wasn't strictly a formal court process. But it also was more than just a reconciliation process. So I think we have to keep looking at this and seeing how we can manage it. But it does raise, you know, it does raise, you know, issues about who is to be tried and how are they to be tried. And let's face it, if you go back to um, Nuremberg, that was a very selective court as well. Um, and it was very much, of course, a winner's court. But not only Nuremberg itself, which just tried, as you know, as a very small fraction mm -hmm. of, of those considered to be responsible. But then there were national war crimes tribunals which were authorized by the United Nations, which were conducted by national judges, but by and large only judged those who were considered to be collaborators uh, of the occupying powers. Yeah. So, you know, we, we th this is an issue that's not new and, um, and I think it will continue whenever you decide to go for formal judicial processes uh, as part of that broader uh, set of um, elements that we call transitional justice, you will face this dilemma. Um, you know, I, I still remember one of the warlords who came to see me after the, after the um, um, I think it was General Peanut Butter, or whatever his nom de guerre was, and he came to see me, and, and um, uh, he was um, he was on the list of um, the sanctions list, the UN sanctions list. And he was anxious to get off it. He'd been elected a senator um, uh, in the first post-war elections that we had overseen. And he came to say, to plead with me to try to get him off the, um, off the list. And I said, well, look, you know, it's not impossible, but, you know, basically you've got to, as I had to say to, um, to a number of them, um, you know, including Prince Johnson, you have to behave yourself. You have to be seen now to really build peace and not just talk about it and then run off the bush and raise the flag of rebellion again. So he promised me solemnly to do this. And then he said to me, he said, I, I really don't understand, you know, why I'm on this list. I did everything uh, for them. I said, what do you mean everything for them? He said, yes, he said, I work very closely with the CIA. <laughs> so I thought, dear God, I mean, who have we been employing? Who have they been? I mean, that's why it's not so easy. I didn't put that thing in the book, I don't think. Uh, uh, it was a bit off the record for you, Matt. But anyway, yeah. but I mean, it was illustrative yeah. of the dilemmas you run into. Yes. Who was doing what to who? Who was working with whom? Yeah. It, is, it isn't so straightforward as we would believe. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that uh, certainly our students will be... Um, covering in the course of the year is, is the importance of understanding the, um, you know, the political economy of these conflicts and the informal yeah. power structures at work. Yeah. Um, and if you don't engage with those informal power structures, you are, as, as, as you will have, as you write in the book, um, you might be sort of um, groping in the dark in terms of, of influence yeah. and, and then pressure points. And that seems to be yeah. a, a, a yeah. very real challenge. Uh, yeah, that was particularly in the Eastern Congo. I mean, uh, quite frankly, until, um, 
you know, there were, there were, you know, the the war economy is a is a form of perverse incentive, um, and the if you finally get control of natural reserves, most of those people who are involved in in uh, especially the Eastern Congo, the Kivus and and Orient, and but also in in, um, um, in Katanga, didn't have much uh, incentive to end the war. Just like the RUF had no real incentive to end the war in in Sierra Leone because they had their supply of diamonds and a few other things. Um, so what are the incentives we, we could offer? You know, talk about peace, reconciliation, kumbaya. <laughs> These are hard-nosed people. Yeah. And they want to know. And that applies all the way down the chain, by the way. It's not just, um, you know, warlords and corrupt uh, commanders and, and politicians who've got their their nose in the trough. It also applies to people who are down in those gravel pits in Sierra Leone, trying to sluice some diamond waste in the Eastern Congo, coal terms of anything, that, that, because there's nothing else. That's it. Yeah. We talk of the war economy as if it's something special, but it is the economy. And yeah. if we don't understand it and how it, how it works, and it covers everything, you know, found groups thriving on the, the smuggling of marijuana, charcoal trading that was one of the um the um the uh fdlr monopolies they managed to get the hold on uh on so until you can and to get hold of that and to manage that you need a strong state and you need a, a pretty good security sector and the forces that can uh, manage it but not themselves which is what's happened a lot in the past in places like liberia and sierra leone themselves and in the eastern congo become part of the problem so it always goes back to this issue of, you know, who's running the state for whose benefit and how are they managing it? And yeah. that's the fundamental weakness. And, and development, if you wait, just to go back to where I started, I think we've come to realize that development is very much about that as well. That these sort of peace, development, humanitarian, at the end of the day, that cohesion, that coherence between the, when you start to fail in one area, you will fail in others. Yes, uh, we, we have already referred to uh, Congo a few times now and I want to to spend a little bit of time on that because you say that indeed you mentioned your book at your your chapters on the Kivus is, is in a way the heart of the book because it sort of crystallizes so many of these issues but but as an introduction into that um, I you know one of the extraordinary things about your 10 years is that they coincide almost perfectly with the rise of protection of civilians as a as a major yeah. focus of UN operations indeed the the Sierra Leone mission in 1999 is the first one where there's an explicit authorization to focus on that. And then, of course, it, it acquires a kind of momentum as you as, as, as just how difficult it is to do. Um, it becomes clearer. Uh, and, and I wonder whether you could reflect uh, perhaps just in by way of introduction to the whole sort of uh, protection of civilians agenda, how you sitting in the field was sort of caught between the pressures coming from international community from the Security Council um, uh, and having to balance that against the whole set of other tasks that you were given to do and when you know how did this creep up on you the centrality of that particular mission and what were the challenges you faced in doing so? Yeah the, the word creep is, is right here because even though it was in that for the first resolu the resolution for UNAMSIL and uh, came after the 1999 report uh, that the Secretary General presented on Korean and on, on uh, protection of civilians, and of course the Brahimi report. I yes. mean, these are all parts of the of the jigsaw, so to speak. Actually, in Sierra Leone, it was very much there because of the atrocities committed against uh, the civilian population. You know, the the uh, but and by the way, it wasn't just the RUF. Uh, it was also the the um, government forces, um, the uh, the SLA initially that was also involved in this. So it, that, it, became a, it became an issue in Sierra Leone because of those years that had gone when these atrocities were widely reported and, you know, together with attacks on particularly women, rape, um, slave, basically sex slaves and, and all the, 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 the horrendous things that happened there. But the mission itself, because by the, we got to the point where the war then, when we found the solution to begin to wind the war down, it began to retreat as an issue. Liberia, we were also, and again, had gone through horrendous, horrendous abuses. 
But again, by the time we got through the ACRA agreement and then the gradual winding down, it was still an issue, but it was lowering its profile because we were able to extend and control. These were also, and I think it's very important, relatively troop to problem ratios were mm -hmm. much, much better uh, yes. in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Yes. Um, and therefore the presence of UN forces was was uh, much more um, visible and and uh, uh, than it and certainly was to be the case, as I say, in the Congo. Sierra, uh, Cote d'Ivoire was one where, when I arrived, the protection of civilians was becoming a bigger issue because there'd been attacks on um, uh, on civilians by both sides, actually. And so that began to be much more of a focus um, it, of that mission. But the one where it really took off was in, is, it was in uh, the Congo. That was, I think, due to a number of things. The, the fact that people were being slaughtered, uh, displaced, um, and on all the other things that were happening, um, the massive violation of uh, human rights that had gone on for not just a year or two, but had gone on throughout the, the first and then the second Congo wars, you know, the, the, the terrible bloodletting, the millions who died directly or indirectly. The reason it acquired, I think, the prominence it did was because um, increasingly that became a center of interest. International NGOs, international community, um, various groups began to coalesce. Much of it driven, I have to say, and rightly so, by the lobbies, uh, humanitarian lobbies, human rights lobbies, focusing especially on what was happening to women and girls. Um, I, I recount there that in, in the book, when I was in Paris, just before I took up my post, I'd gone to Paris to talk to the French. And the first question I had from the then head of the IO department in the Quai d'Orsay was, you have the largest peacekeeping mission in the world. Why are this, the mission not dealing with and uh, controlling sexual exploitation and abuse uh, in the Eastern Congo. And that was a question I then, it became frankly, yeah. so that was, was in a way generated, added a face to the protection of civilians issue. Because yeah. you talk about protection of civilians and it's sort of rather amorphous, but then you start showing pictures of Pansy Hospital where um, um, Dr. Mukwega is, and heal Africa in Goma, and you know you start seeing what happens to these to women and girls, and that adds a certain reality, um, and and that's what helped to change I think the global perception, although it was a subset of a much bigger issue um, uh, that we were having to deal with. But these elements all came together I think in the Congo in a way that was became much more visible. Um, it was an issue for the age, if you will, and I think the international attention, particularly uh, through the human rights groups and so forth, um, became, and the council took it on board. It didn't, fortunately, uh, get lost in sovereignty issues. Mm. Uh, it didn't get lost in Cold War divides. Um, you know, people were willing to speak out about it, and, you know, uh, Whereas before much of this had been, even though things were happening, had got subsumed into either um, Cold War rivalries or afterwards, particularly in the case of the Eastern Congo, the whole reaction to what had happened in Rwanda. Uh, because as we know, and the mapping project showed, I mean, it's highly controversial, contention, very contentious, I know, with the Rwandan authorities, but clearly the invasion of Eastern, then still Eastern Zaire, um, created massive, massive um, casualties, and there were atrocities on a large scale yeah. committed by the Rwandan forces, um, just as they'd been, you know, uh, in Rwanda itself. Maybe not, a, I wouldn't, I mean, to be, to be clear, I'm not comparing the two. Um, yeah. There wasn't a mass genocide, in, but there were huge numbers of casualties. All of these things came together. And as I say, the initially there was a sort of, um, uh, while the war was still going on, uh, it was not possible to really uh, intervene in a way that seemed as if the UN was taking sides. But gradually, as the, as things wore, as the war wore down, the First and Second World uh, Congo Wars, and then we began to see the action of these groups like the uh, FDLR, the CNDP. Um, this began to galvanize, and opinion started to change. 
particularly, I must say, in Western Europe and uh, and in the United States, um, it coincided with the with the change of um, in um, in uh, in the United States with President Obama coming into um, into office, and I think there was more willingness there then to start hammering away on these issues. And, yeah, uh, can I just uh, uh, not interrupt, but just take you up on that because clearly greater attention was given to it. Um, but there is all, of course, the, the classic tension here between willing the ends and the means here. And I think yeah. one of the great strengths of, of your book is, you know, the, the French d'Orsay may very well have said that you have a very large mission, but uh, it's all relative as it were. Yeah. And, and I think uh, one thing which struck me, um, not just from the DRC, but generally where the UN deploys, and maybe it's less the case than it used to be, as you put it, when a peacekeeping operation deployed with a protection mandate, there is a common, almost automatic, uh, but unrealistic expectation that it will afford blanket protection, irrespective uh, of civilians for the areas that prominent capabilities. And you are sort of creating um, expectation, which if you are not able to deliver with them, uh, might in, in many ways, not just leave you with very, very difficult decisions at your sort of mission level, uh, but potentially aggravate uh, a local uh, protection crisis. And I wonder whether uh, this brings, of course, in the question of the use of force, which you, you had to confront, and the very, very difficult judgments that you, you had to make. So yes, it is true that focusing on, on POC and DRC was absolutely necessary, given what was happening. But if you're not willing and prepared to provide the means, either in terms of resources or in political track, then aren't you potentially um, making your life more difficult and also the challenge more difficult. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, no, I could agree on that. Um, the, the line you just quoted in from the book was inspired by something that happened actually not in the Kivus. It was in, or, in Oriental province when the, um, the LRA attacked civilians. And that attack was actually had happened because of, which I do refer to, a US-Uganda initiative to try to deal with the LRA and to capture Connie, which went wrong. The LRA, which had been sort of sequestered almost in um, Garrison, is, too, too, is not really the right word, in the Granba National Park, then fled uh, and were able to get away largely and then started moving west, heading probably towards Central African Republic, massacring um, civilians on the way, raiding for food and so forth. Uh, when this happened, even though we had a small presence in that area, wasn't a top priority area for us, that was the Kivus, we got a blistering attack, particularly from MSF, which really, really annoyed me because they said, you know, you're failing in your mandate to protect civilians. Well, anybody who was really familiar with that area would know that it's a huge area, ungoverned or undergoverned, that's for sure, little in the way of roads, and the, the, the um, Congolese force that was there, that we were trying to help with supply and get self-organized. There was no way that they could possibly deal with this, because the um, LRA was actually, uh, was one of those um, armies that moved on foot. There were small numbers. They didn't need advanced logistics. They literally lived off the land a little bit like the RUF. And I was really angry at that. And I told MSF, I said, this is deeply unfair. Um, you know, we didn't set this up. We certainly weren't even aware of it. And we do not have a protection of civilians mandate that covers the entire country, every single uh, district. It's just not possible. Um, and by, you know, attacking us in this way, you're undermining us. Yes. We've, we, we're, we're, I'm willing to admit mistakes and we made them, but not in this particular case. So I was really, that then in turn, of course, triggered lots of wondering about what could we do to protect civilians? So we made, you know, these innovations, everything from market patrols to what we call liaison, local liaison officers. I mean, we had hotlines, we developed a whole range of issues, but we were constantly dealing with the symptoms, not yeah. the causes. And as I put somewhere in the book, if we'd really wanted the kinds of penetration of protection that you had, say, in Kosovo, yes. we would have needed an army of 50,000, 60,000, yeah. which would have run into the billions. That was never going to happen. Yeah. 
Yeah. That was never good. Plus, we had to deal with with uh, uh, the CNDP and uprising, which was getting indirect, although they always denied it, was getting aid and comfort from Rwanda. So, you know, you have all these competing demands on you. And this is why I came to the conclusion at the end that, um, you know, mandate and means need to go together, that the use of force has its value, um, but it's always going to be a, of limited value. Uh, and that clearly, as you yourself have written uh, in your work, Mats, um, and rightly so, use of force, we must be careful it doesn't become a palliative uh, because it doesn't, usually, it is not the long-term solution. You may deal with particular situations like we did in Ituri, the general come out and it worked well, but the Ituri problem hasn't gone away. I mean, I'm still struck when I pick up the daily news and I have a feed from the DRC, how many of those issues and conflicts are still there? Yeah. Despite the brigade, the intervention brigade, which I'd call for actually, so I can't say it was a bad idea, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but unless we get down to the politics, and that in turn is not just about having a better army, it's about frankly governance and government. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't see that changing. Um, and what we've done, unfortunately, with the protection of civilians and the use of force and linking the two is to protect, as I said there, governments from their own failings. Yeah. We yeah. can't protect people, ultimately, you cannot protect people from the failings of their own government. Yeah. And, and of that's course, a fundamental dilemma. Exactly. And of course, as you do make clear in the book, part of the problem is, is precisely, particularly over time for your mission, you're deployed for an extended period of time. You are there to support the government. Um, you are there with their consent. But in this particular case, of course, they are one of the principal um, uh, yeah. violators yeah. of human rights themselves. And that creates huge yeah. difficulty in terms of how you approach and deal with the government yeah. itself. Well, we were mandated. You know, there were a lot of dilemmas there. Like, we were actually mandated to help the National Army, the FARDC. And we did try. We did do training and we did advisory work and so forth. But this became a millstone for us because every time the FARDC went off the, off the ramp, so to speak, um, then we were blamed for, even though the unit concerned had nothing to do with us, we were then blamed or being accused of being, I was even in a situation that <clears throat> when um, uh, Human Rights Watch, to be honest, um, basically accused us or warned us about complicity in war crimes because we had been involved with the FARDC. Um, even though the council had mandated us mm. to help the FARDC to help deal with the security problems. Yeah. Well, when you're in these situations, and I, I actually said in a closed session of the council, I brought that to the council's attention quite in a quite passionate way. I said, well, what do you want us to do? Um, I got an interesting response, which was silence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the council didn't want to wrestle with that issue. No, exactly. um, just put something in the resolution and uh, roll it over. And yeah. this is why we're still in the Congo, yeah. because the fundamental problems are still there and will be there. And we yeah. made it worse. And I have to say now I'm getting off back into my more now to my foundation time. But we went along with the international community, not all of it. And the Africans were a little bit more sturdy, I must say. But key members of the council went along with basically a completely fraudulent election that would have brought the person to power who had actually won. And in the mistaken idea that this would create stability and we'll at least see the back of Kabila, which we haven't seen, they went along with it. So, you know, you've got somebody in government now who doesn't have the legitimacy, and I would say even the credibility, and Kabila is still there basically calling the shots. So the same problems are there. And, um, you know, unless we deal with that and we're honest in the level of the council and, um, or come up with alternatives like they did, I think, in the case of Liberia, with the um, the government of no return, what I call the government of no return. Then, and that went back to when Kabila was allowed to become president after his father passed away. And that was a deal that the major powers and the UN went along with. They even brokered that deal, to be very honest. Yeah. I, I do want to, I mean, there's so much overlap between themes and cases here and, and you have already mentioned the Security Council but I do want to spend a little bit of, of time I have your views uh, on on the challenges of, of, of running a 
a UN peacekeeping uh, operation. And I do think that really is one of the most valuable aspects of the book, um, because it does bring out, as I suggest, the intensely you know, political nature of the organization, its intergovernmental character, uh, and also the way in which it is you know, still profoundly and deeply um, fragmented. I also thought when I read your book that you managed the, um, very skillfully um, without offending anyone, because you don't use <laughs> names on the whole, um, to nonetheless give the impression that um, it, were, it was pretty tough at times within the mission, fairly profound disagreements, personalities didn't really always work. There is also this fault line, which you're very explicit about between the humanitarian side and those who, yeah. who wanted to push a more aggressive agenda. And of course you admit as they go along, uh, you, you, you learned um, how perhaps you should, you might have wanted to do it differently in terms of building a mission leadership and so on and so forth. But I wonder whether you could say a little bit about the challenges of mission leadership, also a little bit about um, relations with, um, with New York. I mean, it is obvious from what you already said about Sierra Leone and Liberia, that if you do have the Security Council on board and they're generally there to support you, it makes your life a lot easier. Yeah. That's a lesson from the 90s as well. Yeah. Um, but also you were frustrated generally about secretary support in New York, I think it is fair to say. Their tendency not to get down into the weeds in terms of unraveling what these mandates actually mm -hmm. meant. Uh, and I like the notion of getting away from what you call a, a strategy syndrome. I mean, what you really need to do is to ask, well, this is the mandate. What does it actually mean? How do you translate into objective? Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether you detected any any progress. And I suppose here you can go on to your role after you left the UN because you can continue to write and think about these things, um, whether this is something which is which is just inherent in the nature of these operations or whether there are lessons to be drawn and learned. Yeah. Um, well, first on the mission management issue, which is, is, is crucial. Um, as, as I said somewhere that these missions are really conjuring tricks, um, you know, kind of sleight of hand. <laughs> they shouldn't work, and the fact that they do at all, uh, I, I think, is amazing sometimes. But sometimes they don't, and when the mission gets into trouble, that's when things begin to unravel. Yeah. And things are going swimmingly well. Everybody's happy. Everybody's getting kudos, and um, everybody wants to invite you to conferences and things. Uh, when the opposite happens, and I've had both, and people I worked for had both, uh, it's very, you, you know, it's you very quickly slip out of. Uh, have yeah. everybody's good graces yeah. and you know the missions are put together including the top management team um in i wouldn't say a haphazard fashion but you know there are a whole series of factors that count you know um nationalities gender and rightly so um so and and there's no chance for these things to gel you know um and once they're put together you're expected to make them work and i'd say a good Part of the time they do, but yes, it doesn't always happen. Um, we're not all going to get on with everybody all of the time. And the issue then is what do you do when that happens? Um, I think you have to exercise your own judgment, uh, recognize that at the end of the day, if things go wrong, um, you're the guy on the spot. You're the one who's going to take the, uh, and I worked a number of SR, two or three SRGs who you know, and I, you know, uh, they basically, uh, not, in t not entirely through their own, but circumstances conspired to make the mission go into a, into a crisis. Um, and they inevitably uh, bore, carried, the, carried the can, so to speak. Um, I ran into the same problem, I'll be honest, in the Congo. Uh, when things go wrong, um, there's a tendency to say, well, X or Y didn't get it right. They didn't get a good relationship with the government or they misread the opposition. I'm not saying that's untrue. Sometimes that is the case. But there's very rarely, there's too often to look at the personalities and not at the more systemic problems that yeah. have led you into that situation. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's, that's really important to, um, and there's a tendency then, as I again refer to, to look for the man on the white horse or I guess today, the woman on the white horse. In other words, let's send in a special envoy yeah. or find a way around the problem. And sometimes that can be very useful. I mean, I recount there how I found it very helpful to work with President Obasanjo, uh, who I got to know in West Africa, and for whom I have a great deal of time, and um, who I think has, has 
was very instrumental in bringing peace to West Africa, used his authority and yes. weight of Nigeria very constructively and worked closely with the UN. Um, but sometimes <clears throat> it's not the case. And then you end up with these serial mediations, yes, yes. <clears throat> which can be quite, yes. quite um, destabilizing actually, because you go all the voices going back and forth. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I, I just, um, and that tends to glide over the more structural problems. Yeah. It's a sense of, well, let's send X and X will find the solution. And when you've been successful in one place, it's assumed that you'll be successful elsewhere. Yes. Yeah. And that, that is not, not a given, not uh -huh. a given. Yeah. And, you know, reputations are made and broken by those, uh, yeah. by what happens. So I think it's important. And, and when you go back to headquarters um, to to try to get the council to understand these elements is is not easy. I mean, I made a point always of trying to see certainly the P5 members, their ambassadors or their deputies individually to, to work through some of these issues. Because in the council itself, it was very pro forma. I understand this has changed a bit, but you, you had this formal session open to the public and the media and so forth. And then the closed session where you plus one or two people from the mission were there with just the delegations and there was no public, uh, no audience where you could speak more frankly and directly. But the response is the ambassadors came with their talking points already laid out. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter what you'd said, they would read from their talking points, which had been prepared prior to the meeting. Right. Um, and then left, leaving a second secretary or a third secretary to just you know, occupy the chair, warm the seat, which was a bit frustrating because you couldn't really have any real dialogue around those issues. And um, it was just another meeting they had to tick off. And uh, and that was it. Um, you know, occasionally you get some pushback. I mean, I remember uh, Susan Rice was one of those. And actually, interesting enough, one of her successes at the, um, as National Security Advisor, also a gentleman by the name of John Bolton, uh, who was then the, it was very interesting because he came along to a session I was addressing and I thought, oh God, what's going to happen now? And he started, he was very, very complimentary and sort of, I want to thank and express our appreciation to SRC Jars for Doss for doing the work he's doing and something. And I thought, my God, this is quite something, you know, hopefully we're making notes of all of this. We can quote him. And then the other shoe dropped because <laughs> he came to the end and what he was really there for was a proposal he was trying to get through which was to reactivate in a meaningful way, or in his view, meaningful way, the Military Assistance Committee. All right. <laughs> uh, that, that was one of his things, you know, he <laughs> felt that peacekeeping missions had sort of, had escaped proper control and oversight yeah. by the council. Yeah. And the people like me came along and sort of uh, were very nice and very, a little bit, um, uh, you know, spoke well, but, did they really know what was going on? So he wanted to, as I understood, he wanted to have a much more hands-on, direct yeah. hold on things and to do it through the Military Assistance Committee rather than through the, the sort of Security Council mechanism. Yeah. And so that was what he'd really yeah. come along to yeah. push. And that was with his, a good part of his uh, intervention was on that. But anyway, I took the plaudits and ran with them. <laughs> I, mean, I just wonder on the... Um... You, you made the point very well that a lot of these uh, missions are put together. Um, uh, there's a lot of politics involved and it doesn't necessarily gel. I just wonder whether, um, it, are there concrete things that, uh, that, that you think would have made your life easier? For example, if greater degree of financial uh, authority, for example, had been delegated to you, if you had been the power to recruit and dismiss uh, without going through the system of human resources, mm -hmm. if you had been able to develop what we talked about before, some kind of uh, analysis uh, capacity, uh, strengthen that, for example, are the concrete things that looking back uh, might still have been possible within what is, we all agree, a very politically fraught and difficult system? Um, yeah, well, I think there are a number of things on the management as well as the more programmatic side. On the management side, um, yeah, I mean, the ability to have more direct control, not, not just to, you know, arbitrarily fire people and all that sort of thing. No, uh, because it wouldn't have been done by me anyway. But but on disciplinary issues, the, the time it took to get anything done in the meantime, people have been, frankly, 
have been involved in some pretty nasty stuff, uh, including, you know, um, uh, sexual exploitation abuse. You you could suspend them with New York's approval, but then they were suspended on on full pay as well, because there had to be a uh, had to be a um, proper inquiry and the rest of it. It took a long time, and New York always erred on the safety uh, on the side of caution because they were very concerned. I can understand that in a way, but of being uh, overruled on appeal yeah. because every staff member has the right to appeal uh, if they're civilian staff to through the UN system to the uh, eventually uh, if there's cause to the UN uh, to the tribunal uh, which is actually is a joint UN ILO um, uh, mechanism that goes back uh, decades of course to the founding and so that made for a very diffuse disciplinary authority the same on the military side where your, where your um, ability to uh, manage discipline was even more diluted uh, because um, there is no, um, the mission, the Secretary General has no disciplinary authority, direct disciplinary authority on, uh, on deployed, um, deployed units, troops. Um, what you could do is recommend that somebody be withdrawn from the mission. You could insist on that, but you couldn't impose um, disciplinary action on them and you couldn't sort of, um, the, the most you could do, and I did threaten it on a couple of occasions, um, is to actually ask for the whole contingent to be withdrawn. Then I got a reaction. Then we get people, generals and the rest of it scurrying in from, uh, from their uh, military headquarters, wherever it was, uh, to plead with me, please, you know, it's just a few bad apples and uh, don't take it out on the rest of us. But occasionally I would ask for officers as well as uh, troops to be, uh, withdrawn and um, uh, individual soldiers. But again, it was, it was a, and you, New York was always reluctant to do it because of course, and I understand that, you know, these are the same countries that they would then have to go to, to try to get troops when the next crisis erupted or the next peacekeeping mission. So they were usually anxious to keep them on their, their good side. Um, uh, but clearly there was a price to pay for that. So it was, it was always a bit of a tug of war, if you will, but where there was, clear evidence and a prima facie evidence of abuse or misbehavior, then, um, uh, and particularly if I insisted, they would withdraw individuals. And as I say, I occasionally said the whole contingent will have to go. In fact, we did actually, I think it was one occasion we got when I was in, uh, um, I can't remember, Liberia, Syria, we got a, we got a whole contingent turned over yeah. uh, before they were due to, due to go on rotation. Yeah. So, I mean, so that was one issue on the civilian side is say, if we'd had more flexibility to recruit uh, and to discipline, that would have been helped because sometimes I'm told that that's now happening as a result of the hippo and then the follow up, there is now a greater delegation, which yeah. I hope is the case because, uh, but headquarters has to let go. And they're always reluctant to do that. Yes. Um, you know, it's the usual bureaucratic instinct to keep things to, to yeah. yourself. Yeah. Um, so I think that is very important. On the on the, the financing side, we actually, I have to say, in all the missions I was in, yeah, we could have done a little bit more for this, a little bit more for that. Um, but by and large, I never felt that was, at least now it's different because yeah. of the cutbacks. But I never really felt um, a... Um, that, that we were we were running on on uh, on empty. Um, I must say we we also, to be very frank, kind of gamed the system, um, which was that uh, you know, care for what you ask for, but then ask for what you need, but ask for it in with a certain percentage added on, and then be willing when you confront the ACABQ of in New York, which is a painful experience, uh, be willing to take off the ten percent, fifteen percent, and they feel good and. Well, you know, you're at where you are, but I shouldn't say that publicly. Um, but anyway, but no, I, that I didn't. Um, feel. What was more annoying was sometimes the sense, and I, I, this comes out in the book, I know, perhaps unfairly a bit, was the, the arcane administrative rules that sometimes we had to cope with. Yes. And the administration was very conservative on these things, partly because, and it, it was later on, I really realized that, that, that uh, you know, they were always worried about audit. Um, you know, what I call the tyranny of audit. 
that, you know, the auditors come in, they find you haven't done this or that. And I knew of cases where people had taken really good decisions, conscientious decisions. But with, I remember one, it involved an ad, a senior administrator, head of administration or the, is the charge of logistics who'd hedged oil supplies for the mission because we were huge in the Congo, huge. We had a huge uh, bill. We were paying mm. tens, tens and tens of millions of dollars uh, a year. I think we paid 100 million for fuel or something, you know, with all those planes and vehicles yeah. and so forth. We had a fleet of, I think, almost 100 aircraft at one point. And he'd hedged forward. Uh, and then, um, uh, which was, I think, a good way of doing it. Then he was criticized by the audit, and I think even the ACABQ, you over-ordered. Why did you need to order that? You didn't use it all up. You're wasting cash because you've got cash locked up in fuel you haven't used. Yeah. They didn't see that the guy was yeah. just trying to be clever. Yeah. And um, yeah. and those sorts of things would, would, would drive me crazy. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and but, I, but as I said, and I, I didn't try to be honest about this, I, I found out the hard way that there was no point. You were you know, hitting your head against the wall. Don't break the rules. Just try to bend them a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And with sometimes my other hats, particularly UNDP in the first mission or two, uh, that was that was very helpful. Um, well, I think you know this. These things were were um, were frustrating sometimes, having to deal with uh, with the bureaucracy that didn't want to sort of accept that you were in special conditions that needed you to be agile, yeah. um, uh, administratively agile. But again, much dependent on, on your staff, because I found from one chief administrative office to another, things could change quite a lot. The same, by the way, with military. I mean, I know of cases and you saw cases where changed the, the contingent commander, the whole ethos changed of, of, of the, the contingent. Yes. Uh, Alan, we've been extremely generous with your time. And I think what I will no doubt do is to ask you to join us again perhaps in a live session with students um, yeah, a bit later in the year so you can have I questions like from the students uh, and there are so many things I mean this is obviously something now students will rush to read your book uh, and and so much of what we touched on is is, is brought up there um, but if you are okay with that I, I think I will we will get back to you later in the year we spent much more time than had originally in this hitch and i realize you might have other things to do as well and we'll try to edit and rec we won't edit it really because i don't think it requires any editing but we'll we'll sort of put it together oh, and present it to you and then we can use it well no that's a pleasure max i in fact Mark, matt um i do indeed have to go off somewhere because i've got to go and visit a brand new granddaughter well, you know, that is, that is critical. And I, and I sort of didn't give you a chance to conclude on something you might want to conclude on, but uh, about the future of peacekeeping and all of that. But I think we can come back to that later in the year. Uh, yes. but, but thank you so much. I thought that was terrific and really enriching and giving us a bit of flesh and blood, which is what we all need when we look at these operations, not just look at the dry, um, you know, UN documents and try yeah. to tease things out of that. You've got to get a feel for the field. Well, let me thank you, Matt, because um, uh, without you, the book wouldn't have got written in the way it was. Because when I consulted you up front, you said, above all, make it personal. Write about what it's like. Yeah. And I'm so glad I followed your advice um, rather than just sort of go off into all kind of abstract stuff, which I'm not good at anyway. Um, no, no, I, I, thought you, I thought you got the, the balance uh, just right. And as I said, you managed to do it without you know, uh, stepping on too many toes. I, I think I told you separately that the one sort of amusing quote you do give is a Claire Short again uh, in a town meeting uh, suggesting that uh, they should exterminate the RUF. Well, quote, that is an absolute quote. And um, Ian Martin's in touch with her quite a lot and Ian's read the book and uh, offered to retail to her those, uh, which I said, okay, I, I won't. Uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> But one thing I wanted not to do was, you know, sometimes memoirs turn into be a, a sort of a, a, a sort of a, a personal reckoning, a setting yeah. of scores. Yeah, no, exactly. So I thought I won't get into that because yeah. you do that, you know, it, it you lose sight of the the, the more yeah. fundamental issues, you know, the quarrels yeah. and stuff. Yeah, but yeah. but uh, so I, I tried to avoid that deliberately rather than. You know, and I, th I think that was that was right. Uh, and I and I also think on on that la very last note on that. I mean, one of the strengths again, it's a bit like Jean Marie's book, where 
uh, what comes out is that the choices you are faced with sort of constantly never present themselves as a straightforward ones between the right choice mm -hmm. or the wrong choice, the right path and the not path. Mm -hmm. And that translates into the moral dimension yeah. of those choices as well. I mean, if it yeah. was only that easy, um, yeah. they all involve uh, some yeah. set of calculations. So. Right. And I, I think it was important. Actually, I found it quite cathartic to look back and recognize your own mistakes and uh, mm. realize that, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, for the best of reasons, you make them, but you make yeah. them. Yeah. Anyway, that's a little bit Terrific. Good, good Matt. Well, All right. Matt. thanks. And to Kieran as well, who's yeah. Yeah. Uh, busily uh, recording, I hope. I don't so, know if you know, I don't know if you, but Kieran has written an absolutely amazing book on the war in Sierra Leone, uh, which oh. uh, I hope he will send to you because it's based on some very serious research, uh, which he did on, on, on the atrocities in particular, but trying to understand and make sense of yeah. them. So Kieran, maybe you'll send him a copy. Yeah, well, I... Yeah, I'll be I, happy I, to <laughs> inflict that book I on hope, you. I hope what I wrote wasn't, uh, you didn't find it too... Uh, off the mark. I'll be interested to see your book. Does your book cover the whole uh, of the war? Um, it, it's really specifically focused on atrocities. So it, it covers the war, but it's 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 almost entirely fixed on the RUF um, yeah. rather than the kind of broader context of peacekeeping and peace building. But uh, yeah. I found what you were saying very interesting, and particularly about Sanko as a person. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, well, the RUF, you know, as as um, there's a great quote I include in the book by, um, I'm sure you've read Lansana Berry's uh, book. Yeah. Um, but he called the RUF an, or, uh, an organized delinquency. <laughs> and I think that very much true, you know, it was a, an army of the underclass and mm. uh, yeah. uh, which resulted from mistakes in governance going all the way back to Shaka Stevens and so forth. Anyway, yeah. for another occasion. Great. Yeah. Excellent, we'll be in touch again, Alan. Yeah, cheers. Yeah. Bye. All right, cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.